Well, welcome everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see the participants filling the webinar. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this session, which is called, What Does Inclusion Mean in the World of Research? Sponsored by Sage Publishing and the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. I'm Elizabeth Cole and I'm today's moderator. I'm a professor of psychology, women's and gender studies and Afro-American and African studies at the University of Michigan. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to take a moment for you to tell us a little about yourselves so our panelists can know a bit about who they'll be talking to. So um, if you could take a minute and tell us your name and where you're located in the chat and maybe also tell us your role in the research ecosystem. Um, so we'd love to see that coming in in the chat. Um, if you have questions for the panelists, please type those in using the Q&A tab. And if you'd like, you can direct them to specific panelists. And how we'll proceed today is we'll have brief presentations from all the speakers. And um, then we will um, start answering the questions from uh, you. So our webinar will be recorded and our registrants will receive a link to the recording um, afterward. And we'll also have the recording archived at the socialsciencespace.com website. So let's meet our guests. We have a publisher, we have a journal editor, and we have a research funder to represent different perspectives in every area of research. Um, joining us today is Carolyn Porter. She's executive publisher of journals at Sage Publishing. She plays a key role in executing SAGE's strategic objectives around the management, development, and growth of its journals business. She sits on the steering group of SAGE's Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Research Task Force. And she also sits on SAGE's Research Integrity Group, and she's a trustee of the Committee on Publication Ethics. Next, we have Meng Ching Lai, the, uh, the session's editor. And he's a staff psychiatrist, clinician scientist, and an O'Brien scholar with the Child and Youth Mental Health Collaborative at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Hospital for Sick Children, and the University of Toronto. He's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry, and he's on the graduate faculty at the Institute of Medical Science and Department of Psychology. And then third, we have Christopher Barnhart, who is the session's uh, representative of the funding perspective. And he's currently a health science policy analyst in the National Institute of Health Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office, where he supports and promotes the health of sexual and gender minority communities through analysis of relevant grant portfolios, manuscript and report authorship, strategic planning, workshop development, outreach coordination, and representation. So we, we have a broad variety of perspectives um, represented here today, and um, I look forward to hearing from them. So why don't we start with Carolyn Porter. Thank you. And I'm going to share my slides briefly. I hope everyone can see that. So hello, everybody. As mentioned, I am going to be talking a little bit about the publisher perspective on inclusion in research. I think before I start, I would like to acknowledge that as a white, able-bodied cis woman, I come to the whole conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion with a load of privilege, and I'm really on a mission to learn and educate myself. Although we've been discussing um, and working to improve diversity and inclusion at SAGE for a long time, events over the last 12 to 18 months have really driven many challenging conversations within the organization about the makeup of our company, our industry, and our publishing. Um, we want to recognize that there is much more work to do in all of those areas. Today, I'll just give a brief overview of progress so far in relation to making our publishing processes more inclusive some of the challenges that we face and the work we have still to do. I'm really not saying Sage has all the answers here. It's very much a work in progress and we're really keen to hear from anyone in the audience um, with your ideas and feedback. So please do share those in the chat. We have social sciences form the core of our publishing and social sciences have a lot to say about societal inequities. 
We have for many years produced um, publications that explore inequality and challenge prejudice, and, and there are a few examples here from our journal's programme. Our, our platform is home to thousands of research articles in this area, and we want and need to amplify that research in order to inform policy and practice and ultimately to drive change. One example of that is um, this microsite. In the wake of the killing of George Floyd, we developed a site dedicated to structural racism and police violence, which now features close to 250 articles on the topic, all of which are free to access. The mission of SAGE is to build bridges to knowledge, which in our journals programme means enabling people from all backgrounds to contribute to scholarship, and it means working to ensure that our publishing processes are unencumbered by bias and prejudice. We recognise this requires active change both within our organisation and across our industry. It's worth noting that, that I'm focusing today on our journals programme, but this work is going on across our publishing operations, including books and digital products as well. So our pledges in SAGE journals are to amplify diverse voices, increase representation, increase visibility and impact of relevant research, to educate ourselves, our editors and our society partners, to ensure that re the research we publish is widely accessible, to encourage diverse and equitable language and referencing, and to be actively anti-racist and anti-discriminatory. We've needed to organize and put structures in place, both top down and bottom up in order to drive this agenda within our company. We've set up a DEI task force within our research publishing program, headed up by a steering group to, in order to give it some oversight and direction, and that incorporates leadership from our US and UK offices. We've divided our work into four um, sort of streams or working groups, each of which is led by a member of the steering group, but comprises members from all levels within our editorial department and beyond. The content stream considers how we handle problematic or sensitive content, along with how to manage potential tensions between publisher intervention and editorial independence. The application stream is committed to increasing the visibility and impact of relevant scholarship in order to forge and influence policy, practice and public understanding of research conducted by or otherwise affecting historically marginalised areas of study or groups. The role of the data stream is to support the work of our programme and to provide data collection and storage solutions that will allow us to track progress on our commitment to DEI in publishing. And the representation stream aims to improve representation of diverse voices in our publishing. And that involves working very closely with our journal editors who are external academics and who are responsible for appointing board members, handling peer review and making decisions about what to publish. It's worth noting that this SAGE can't make this happen by ourselves and we're actively contributing to industry initiatives in order to improve inclusion in the publication of research. One of those examples is the Royal Society of Chemistry's Joint Commitment for Action on Inclusion and Diversity in Publishing, which has a working group comprising representatives from 40 major publishers. And we're working to pool our resources, expertise and insight to accelerate research culture change and tackle biases in scholarly publishing. There are challenges um, that we and other publishers face in trying to make our processes more inclusive. Whilst many editors are keen to work in partnership with us to drive change, some resist guidance as they see it as interfering with editorial independence. We have, however, added wording to our editor contracts and our ethics handbook that require our editors in chief to develop diverse editorial boards and avoid bias in their decision making. Some journals have multiple stakeholders and many of our titles are owned not by SAGE, but by learned societies. The good news is that many societies recognize the importance of this, this issue and are actively working to become more inclusive. Data is quite a significant challenge that we face. If we want to improve, we really need evidence and data about the extent of the problem at the title and discipline level and set targets to improve. 
The data stream that I mentioned earlier is grappling with some big questions about the practicalities of collecting sensitive personal data to do with systems, etc. The ethical questions about what we should ask, why we ask it, how we should ask it, and how we will use the data. And of course, legal and GDPR perspectives about collecting diversity data. Language, English is often regarded as the lingua franca of scholarship, but this presents major challenges to diversity and is something that many publishers and journal editors are really struggling with. And there are not easy answers there. Time and conflicting priorities, there are often pressing, many, many pressing demands on Sage journal publishing editors and on our external editors. And so that can make it difficult for them to carve out space and time to actively work in this area. But it's important to ensure that inertia doesn't kick in and we keep active in our efforts to improve the situation. It's also important to avoid tokenism or DEI being seen as a tick box exercise. One editor who shall remain nameless um, responded that they felt they had a diverse editorial board already because there was one black member on their board. We are up against the sad reality that there are huge inequalities and systemic biases within higher education and academia more broadly. However, the good news is that many universities are seeking to address those imbalances. We at SAGE certainly recognize that we must play our part in supporting change. One example of the way we do that is by, in the UK, is by supporting an organization called Leading Roots. And that is a pioneering initiative that works to improve the pipeline for black academics and black students and to prepare the next generation of black scholars from a black led perspective. Finally, the scale of the task can feel daunting at times. We are learning all the time from each other and from our editors, authors, societies and board members. So in terms of the next areas of focus, um, we're keen to keep working across the industry and beyond. We want to contribute to knowledge and discussions, for example, what to do about offensive content that may be in our archive, how to overcome challenges with data collection and so on. We want to continue forging strategic alliances with the organizations and supporting those organizations. And we really need to focus on implementation and delivery. So we have DEI goals in, um, in the objectives for all our publishing editors, and we are keen to keep this conversation going and make it an active conversation with our academic editors, editorial boards, and other communities. And vitally, we want to keep educating ourselves, discussing this matter with colleagues, um, this event is a great opportunity for us to participate and support this conversation across multiple um, parts of the scholarly ecosystem. And we also want to share good practice and really hold ourselves to account. So I'll hand over now to Dr. Mun Chen Lai, who is going to talk about the edit editor perspective. Thank you. Great, thank you, Caroline. Um, just make sure everyone can see the slide. Perfect. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar. And uh, I'm Meng Chen Lai, I'm here representing the uh, academic editorial team of the journal Autism International Journal of Research and Practice published by SAGE. I'm going to share with you a few examples following Caroline's uh, uh, discussion about the initiatives uh, that's related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. So Autism is a journal that's focused on publishing academic papers uh, and scholarly work, focusing on a diverse range of topics related to uh, autistic people and the community. As you can see on the right-hand side, these are the areas of interest that this journal publishes. So it spans really widely from basic science to clinical uh, disciplines, but they all need to have practical implications. This is a journal that's uh, funded uh, by a SAGE in association with the UK's National Autistic Society back in 1997. It publishes eight volumes um, per year. 
So we are a, a leading autism journal in the field of developmental psychology as well as uh, autism research. Uh, we produce really and um, have the privilege to publish high impact and high quality publications from the field. So just to give everyone a sense of what, uh, what's being published in the journal. So these are uh, from the website, uh, the most widely cited papers uh, in the past three years. As you can see, it can come from uh, uh, discussions surrounding co-production, uh, psychological research related to uh, how to improve uh, autistic people's uh, well-being, mental health, as well as uh, practical guidelines surrounding uh, a inclusive research, and also a range of clinical and mental health and practical issues. Regarding the uh, initiatives of equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, this is journal editorial that's going to be published in uh, hopefully uh, soon, led by our editor, uh, Professor Sue Fletcher Watson in Edinburgh. So in this editorial, uh, we outlined uh, key issues that we thought important related to publishing standards. And as you can see, there are a few different topics. The one, the major domain is inclusion and leadership. So we talked about community partnership being so critical and core to the editorial effort as well as the journal itself, which uh, is the case from the beginning of this, uh, of this journal in association with National Autistic Society. We also talked about uh, a longstanding uh, convention that we have, which is inclusive dissemination by producing lay abstract and also podcasts and other dissemination materials that translate the scientific knowledge into accessible format for the general public. I would like to focus specifically today on a few examples of uh, inclusion, inclu increasing diversity and inclusion. Also uh, our language statement that covers this aspect as well as a special issue about a uh, global context that I'm going to um, uh, highlight a bit more. So to start with, increasing diversity is a ongoing effort. We recognize that in our editorial board, as you can see, we have eight journal academic publishers, uh, sorry, ad academic editors, who are all academics and researchers, mostly coming from the United States, Europe, uh, Canada, Australia. Uh, our social media editor, as well as editorial assistants are also from these countries. Um, in order to diversify our editorial team, we are seeking, uh, we're, uh, putting into lots of efforts to diversify not only the board, but also our editorial member. So in a recent call of uh, recruiting more academic editors, as you can see, uh, we uh, specifically outlined that we encourage applications from historically marginalized and unrepresented groups, uh, especially autistic scholars, uh, applicants from Global South, applicants who self-identify as Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. So this is just one example of a uh, ongoing effort of diversifying our editorial board. The second example here, um, which is our language guidance that will be on our website very soon. Um, so in the field of autism research, we uh, recognize that it is very important to be respectful to autistic people, autistic people's families and also caregivers. So uh, thanks to our editor, Liz Pelicano and our social media editor team, they developed uh, this guide to, uh, uh, to uh, enhance uh, uh, the journal um, potential author's uh, reflection on how to adequately use and select language in a sensitive and a respectful way. There are topics that are being discussed about in the field of autism research specifically, person first versus identity first language. So as some of you might know, in the field of medicine, uh, there's a history that people consider um, a person first language, for example, people with particular condition to be generally more respectful. Uh, however, uh, there are more recognition nowadays that in certain um, um, fields, for example, in developmental disabilities and also in autism, with the uh, acknowledgement, the understanding of neurodiversity and also the preference from community members, identity first language has been considered to be more respectful and more accepted. So uh, we talked about these uh, ideas and uh, considerations. We also talked about historical 
labels has been used in this subfield. So as some of you might have heard, there has been this term of high functioning autism versus low functioning autism. Nowadays, we recognize that they are ambiguous terms and they may not that be accurate unless you have a clear measurement of what one means by functioning. So also there are topics about uh, the terminology related to uh, quote unquote, at risk for autism versus likelihood or probability of having autism and how we um, describe and operationalize the comparison group in a so-called so uh, case control design um, framework that has been used quite widely um, in the field of psychological research and medical research. We also outline some non-preferred languages for the author's consideration. But most importantly, we recognize that uh, the, the terminology preference and all these knowledges are generally uh, generated so far from uh, research and community engagement efforts in the UK, the USA, Canada, Australia, and some of the other European countries. So the decision still needs to be made based on local context. The final topic I want to touch upon is the uh, effort to increasing inclusiveness in terms of publication. So this pie chart shows the number, uh, actually percentage of, of submission from different countries to our journal between 2018 to 2021 till now. As you can see, most submissions come from US, UK, Australia, Canada, some European countries like Netherlands, Sweden, and other countries like Israel, Taiwan, Italy, Hong Kong, South Africa. In terms of publication, it remains uh, similar that most of the publications still come from these countries outlined above. So given this context, we recognize that there is a need to enhance the scholarship in a more global context. So this is a uh, ongoing special issue call that we created a special issue uh, trying to uh, enhance the, um, uh, the inclusion of publication from uh, scholarly work produced and coming from uh, non-weird country uh, and non-weird population. So there is this um, unfortunate um, fact that most of the autism research uh, so far come from high income uh, countries around the world but most autistic people and families actually are living in middle and low income countries. So there's a need to fill the gap. Uh, and that is why we produced this special issue. And we also invited guest editors who are scholarly, uh, who conducted scholarly work and also practical work around the world. Um, for example, Dr. Mudim Bakari from Nigeria, Dr. Jongxin Jiang from Taiwan, Dr. Gauri Devan from India, Dr. Rosa Huistra and Mich uh, Michelle Villa Lobos from UK and US, but who also conducted global work. What I would like to highlight here is that in this particular call, we aim to uh, capture all different perspectives and disciplines related to autism in uh, across the world, uh, but most focusing on uh, low and middle income countries. We recognize that because of the different uh, settings in low resource, uh, uh, communities and places, sometimes uh, even the participant inclusion may not be uh, uh, as uh, in the same way as uh, what is usually considered uh, like a standard way for autism research publications in high income countries. So for example, lots of the research population may be developmental disabilities in general, rather than isolated diagnosis. We recognize that and we also um, uh, only ask the authors to outline the relevance to autism specifically. One important, uh, actually two more final points to note is that we uh, would like to uh, have the author groups uh, coming from the local context rather than uh, researchers or clinicians coming from uh, Western high income countries who go to a place to conduct research and then publish the research uh, themselves. We would like to publish work that's stemming from and coming from a uh, local context. So uh, the uh, author groups and researchers uh, needs to be um, from uh, the diverse uh, countries and um, communities. And finally, considering language being a big barrier of publication, 
uh, we have built in a special mechanism trying to reduce the systemic barrier. So thanks to Sage's uh, support, there's a pilot that we're going to implement to provide language editing services to uh, selected uh, suitable publications uh, considered by the guest editorial team uh, in order to reduce the barrier of language publication. And this uh, the, reduce um, the, ba the barriers because of language. Uh, we also would like to invite our editorial board members to provide lang language support for publications that may only uh, uh, require minor language editing or grammatical corrections. So it is a initiative from the whole uh, editorial team trying to uh, reduce uh, barriers for publication considering inclusion. So this final slide is my personal preference. And some of you may have seen this one in, on the internet. And I think for me personally, equity is a process towards justice. So the whole point and all the efforts are really trying to bring down the systemic barrier that has been there for a long while. And that is the effort that we all uh, need to pay attention to and try hard to work on. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Christopher Barnhart from NIH United States to continue the discussion. Hi, and thank you. Yes, I will be providing information on inclusion from a funder's perspective, specifically focusing on SGM health research at the National Institutes of Health. And a quick note on terminology, SGMs or sexual and gender minorities is a more research oriented term for members of the LGBTQI plus community. And when I say SOGI, I'm referring to sexual orientation and gender identity, which you'll hear when I talk about data. So what is happening related to inclusion at the NIH? Well, the 21st Century Cures Act passed by Congress in 2016 included language on the encouragement of SGM participation in NIH funded clinical research and the development of SGM specific research methods and measures related to reporting. So we basically have a mandate for inclusion. NIH recently released its second agency-wide SGM research strategic plan for 2021 to 2025 that highlights overarching considerations in SGM research, specific scientific themes and research opportunities, and operational strategic goal areas for advancing the health and well-being of all SGMs. And speaking of, that is exactly the mission of my office, the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office. Um, we have a lot of inclusion relevant activities, including offering technical assistance to current and potential SGM researchers, providing SGM related language and perspectives to interested parties within and outside of the organization, presenting to internal and external groups to raise awareness and understanding of SGM health and needs, and publishing annual reports and portfolio analyses that summarize relevant NIH wide efforts and research. There are also trans agency bodies that help to ensure SGM inclusion at the NIH, our SGM Research Coordinating Committee helps us to uh, keep abreast of SGM relevant research activities and potential collaborations across our institute centers and offices. Our research working group provides subject matter expertise and input on NIH SGM research and related efforts from an extramural perspective as well. There are also numerous other institutes and offices that help to promote inclusivity within and outside of the agency. For example, our National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, the Office of Scientific Workforce Diversity, and the Office of Intramural Training and Education. NIH staff participate in transfederal efforts to ensure representation and consideration of the SGM community and their priorities, needs, and concerns in government efforts. Some of those include the Pride and Federal Service Initiative, HHS-wide LGBT Coordinating Committee, and the Interagency Measuring SOGI Research Group, among others. We also have social groups like Sayateras and Friends and Fellows that help bring together and fortify the community of LGBTQI plus researchers and personnel at our agency and ensure that they have appropriate support, resources, and opportunities. Opportunities like professional development, uh, participation in committees, social interaction, et cetera. So what are some of the different lever levers and opportunities available to y'all to increase inclusion? Well, one of the most important is advocating for and supporting collection of SOGI and expanded sex data, for example, including intersex folks. This is critical for developing and evaluating tailored research, determining representation and career trajectories in workforces, and also creating a welcoming and inclusive work environment, among many other reasons. Data collection efforts must, however, address issues such as the continuing evolution and fluidity of the language used within the SGM community, and also organizational willingness to ask SOGI and sex-related questions. 
NIH has a variety of relevant data collection efforts that you may be able to participate in or leverage to increase inclusivity, including our All of Us program, which aims to build a one million person data set to determine how biology, lifestyle, and environment affect health. They collect SOGI and sex in their basic survey, which everyone takes. Anyone can participate and contribute to this important effort. Um, everyone can explore the All of Us data set through their public data browser, and they also have a researcher workbench that just opened up for more sophisticated analyses, and it allows off access to a more expansive data set. NIH also supports the Phoenix Toolkit, which provides recommended standardized data collection protocols. They feature measures to assess SOGI and sex, and also potentially relevant adaptable measures for dimensions of identity and key conditions and issues that affect the SGM community even today. SGMRO hosts a methods and measurement webpage that offers a variety of data-related resources, including example SOGI questions, um, which nationwide questionnaires have included SOGI and sex, and also some relevant manuscripts. And any or all of these could potentially serve as a jump off point for helping to increase inclusion at your organizations through data. On this subject, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that NIH commissioned a consensus panel through the National Academies on Sex and SOGI Data Collection in clinical, research, and administrative settings. And this has far reaching implications for accurately determining SGM representation in the workforce, the NIH research portfolio, and beyond. So please stay tuned. We hope to have something for you by December. Another lever available to y'all is responding to requests for information. And these are publications in which agencies solicit comments and input on specific topics from stakeholders nationwide, including members of the public. For example, OMB recently released an RFI on methods and learning practices for advancing equity and support for underserved communities through government. This includes SGMs. Current open RFIs of potential relevance to equity, diversity, and inclusion can be found on the Federal Register website. One issue that we um, that has been gaining more and more attention at our agency is increasing the diversity of our reviewers. And um, I actually just found out about this. Our Center for Scientific Review has an early career reviewer program. And this program aims to help early career scientists become more competitive as grant applicants through firsthand experience with peer review. And it also serves to enrich and diversify CSR's pool of trained reviewers. So you might wanna take a look at that. You can also take a look at our portfolio analyses and our strategic plan to identify potential gaps and opportunities in the SGM research portfolio and use those to craft targeted grant submissions. We just uh, had a request for applications that focused on improving measurement of SOGI status and related constructs like coming out. There is an open notice of special interest in sexual and gender minority health and research through NIMHD. SGMRO annually conducts an administrative supplement program and that allows expansion of existing parent awards to include SGM populations or research questions. And you may also be eligible to apply for a diversity supplement depending upon the institute or center to which you apply because although SGMs have been identified as underrepresented, they're certainly underserved. In that vein, SGMRO hosts regional workshops that take place across the country and are open to anyone in the region. And these are used to help improve grants personship for and inclusion of those interested in applying to the NIH, particularly in the field of SGM health research. You might also consider participating in NIH supported programs that seek to expand inclusivity in the biomedical research workforce, including the MGen Scholars Program, NIMHD's Health Disparities Research Institute, and the Diversity Career Development Program through our National Cancer Institute. Finally, NIH has an SGM scientific interest group that is open to everyone, and it brings together extramural and intramural researchers and NIH personnel to discuss and address issues of critical import to the LGBTQI plus community. I just wanna close by saying that the end game here is not only to improve inclusion, but also diversity and equity in our workforce so that we have the best minds working to address the problems that still plague our nation. The activities that I just spoke to you about do not constitute an exhaustive list of inclusion efforts at the NIH, nor the options available to you to increase inclusivity, but it's intended to give you a sense of what has worked at our agency, how you can be more involved in our inclusion efforts, and some ideas for increasing inclusion at your own organizations. And with that, I'll pass it back to Liz for the Q&A session. After doing Zoom for over a year, I still have to remember to unmute myself. So um, thank you to all our panelists for these um, really comprehensive and insightful presentations. And um, I get the privilege as the moderator of throwing out some of the first questions, but I also want to remind our um, 
those of you who are watching, that we welcome your questions and please post them in the Q&A screen and I'll keep an eye on that and um, route them to our panelists. So um, I would like to start by um, kind of riffing on a comment that Melita Garza uh, asked in the chat um, and she wrote it during Carolyn's uh, presentation, but I think it's relevant for all three panelists. Um, through your networks and your um, you know, knowledge of what's going on in your area, um, what do you know about how representative your efforts are of what's going on in the field at large? Um, what are other funders doing? What are other journals doing? Um, we'd love to hear maybe a little bit of reflection on kind of the bigger picture of how these diversity efforts are um, or initiatives are progressing. I'm happy to comment first off. Um, so yes, I, I think it's important to say that this is Sage, certainly a, from a publisher perspective, we're not alone in trying to um, tackle some of these issues. I mentioned in my presentation, the Royal Society of Chemistry joint commitment uh, to inclusion and diversity in publishing, and that involves 40 major publishers all working together collaboratively. And I think one of the really um, sort of inspiring uh, things about being involved in that is that I think there's real kind of energy and openness and commitment to, to trying to drive change and, and support um, publication across, you know, historically underrepre underrepresented or marginalized communities and to, to really sort of improve the publication process and decision-making process around um, the publication of research. So that's that's one example, but I, there are many others, and I know that this is um, a, a really important uh, item on the agenda for many major publishers. Um, I think we we all recognise that some of these issues are systemic, and we can't. No one publisher or journal or university can sort of solve it. Um, by themselves, it it really does does need to be a collaborative effort. Thank you. Um, if I may add on to what Caroline just outlined, I think this is this is definitely a joint effort and it's ongoing effort across different um, sectors in scientific publishing. And you know this expands from uh, researchers uh, from grassroots uh, efforts all the way up to funders policy, like Christopher just mentioned, and also the initiatives from the publications. So in our field, um, I think generally in developmental disabilities research, um, autism research, all the way up to psychological science, scientific research, um, it, uh, the, the, the progress of uh, how much uh, uh, explicit EDI or inclusion, uh, equity, diversity initiative has been put forward really depends on the disciplines. So some disciplines has a long tradition of co-production and uh, or the other term uh, that's used to patient oriented research. For example, in those disciplines, there may be, uh, they started earlier, there are more of this inclusive effort, you know, decades ago already. Some fields uh, uh, actually um, are following up uh, actually based on the researchers' um, experiences and also based made the initiative provided by the funder or the, um, or the researcher. And one example we usually like to refer to is uh, NIH and other major funding agencies uh, uh, like uh, the SGM uh, uh, initiative that Christopher mentioned. So that's really having a, a top-down effect of reminding people how important it is to consider inclusiveness. So I, I think this is really a joint effort. Um, it's ongoing. Um, maybe people, different disciplines have different progress, but I believe all of us are aware of and are trying uh, moving forward towards the direction. Christopher, did you have any thoughts? Um, it's a little bit more siloed in government, um, but as I mentioned, we participate in Pride and Federal Service, which has representatives from all over, like Census and DOL and DOD, and I know that there are efforts within the employee workforce to improve inclusivity. Um, they are making strides. They are, they are forming employee resource groups. They're trying to make changes to language, um, but Again, I can't really speak specifically 
to all of their efforts because there are so very many and there are so many groups that people are trying to lift up and include, um, but they are happening. And uh, if you're interested in them, I encourage you to reach out to the agencies because we love hearing from, from the public. We're here to serve. Great, thank you. Um, once again, I wanna remind our viewers that um, we would love to uh, read your, read, you know, we would love to put your questions to the panelists. So if you have some, please put them in the Q and A. Um, a question that I had listening to these three uh, presentations was thinking about, you know, I think all three of you touched on um, the problem of structural barriers, which I think are kind of always the most difficult to address. Um, and so I was thinking about um, kind of the problem of creating diversity and inclusion in the next generation of people who are doing research and publishing research. Um, both the question of how to um, bring more diversity into that pipeline, and then also how to get, um, encourage more participation in research from people who might not be from the institutions that are, you know, most likely to publish or have the most resources to publish. Um, and so really my question kind of gets at um, the excellent slide that um, Meng Chin had about inclusion is, is removing the opaque fence, right? So that everyone can take part. Um, and so I, I wondered if maybe you could comment a little either. Um, I mean, I think some of you sort of addressed efforts toward that area, but maybe also talk about barriers or how that kind of longer term um, impact that we need to have to really move these efforts forward, um, how that's being thought about in your area. Um, maybe I can speak to that a little bit from the extending the example that I mentioned. So uh, when looking at the publication of autism, the journal autism itself, we realized this, again, as I mentioned, bias of where the, the, the knowledge come from. So this um, whole initiative of creating a special issue as a first step uh, to address this is uh, really from Professor Sue Fetcher Watson, one of our editors who thought it's really important to uh, try to do something as a start. And in order to do that, we recognize there are a range of different barriers and no initiative can address all of them, but we can address things that we can start to address mm -hmm. and maybe relatively more easier to tackle with sufficient resource and uh, adjustment. Um, so the creation of this special issue call was a, uh, a demonstration of how, how uh, journals may be able to move things forward with that. Because within special issue, there may be more room and flexibility in uh, providing uh, uh, efforts to reduce barrier or to provide support if needed. And this is of course in, a, in this context of um, what's the power structure in scientific publishing. So I think Caroline mentioned about this idea, English being the primary language of scientific publication, which is definitely a barrier for non-English non non speakers as, I, as myself. And um, um, so the effort that we're trying to put in uh, in the special issue is really considering uh, how much we can reduce the language barrier, which is a, you know, existing systemic barrier, which is often a barrier for all scientific publishing. So um, there's no one quick fix on that because this is the, you know, the, the issue. So the editorial team's effort would try to tease apart, is this, uh, is this work um, um, uh, experiencing barriers because of language and expression? or is it more of an issue with the quality and of the work? So if it's, if it's really um, something about the language barrier that we are able to put in more efforts to reduce the barrier than, you know, than we're trying to do. And we're so lucky that we have Sage support to provide potential pilot on additional language editing services, which is costly uh, for some selected publications. But apart from that, it needs to be volunteering from our editorial board member to put in effort to that. And I think this is just one attempt. I, I'm not saying this is a long-term solution, but I think this is something we all have to think about how to uh, create mechanisms to reduce barrier. And this is just one example, it's language barrier. There are other things that's uh, beyond this topic, um, but just want to put it out there. 
Great, thank you. So I might pop in and just say, um, when you deal with funding on a national level, you see that there are so very many different types of inequity and they are they affect people to different degrees and they keep people out to different degrees. Um, I think one of the biggest problems that we face is that non-white folks are not getting as many large research grants. They are not getting high, as high as white people are up in the chain of you know, professorship. And um, that's been an ongoing issue at the NIH. And they've tried several things. And I mean, they help to an extent, but I think one of the best ways to do it is to encourage, encourage um, people of color to apply earlier and to take advantage of the specialized programs, such as our diversity supplement program. Mm -hmm. They can also strengthen the diversity supplement to provide more support. Um, we have several grant types that enable protected time to help train folks to get them ready to move on and become more independent in their research careers. Um, that's one issue. Another one is just structural racism it affects everyone. As we've seen at our agency, we developed the Unite Initiative and that was created to identify and address structural racism within the NIH supported and the larger scientific community. Um, specifically, the I committee is tasked with changing NIH culture and structure to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion within the organization. And the E committee will evaluate extramural policies and processes to identify and change those that per perpetuate a lack of inclusivity and diversity. Um, that's one of the big initiatives, and you can search for that on our website as well. And one final one I might mention is the, um, the lack of diversity in our reviewers. <laughs> so I literally just found out about the early career reviewer program, and apparently it's been around for a while. So I very much encourage people to check that out. It's a way to really bring in people with diverse backgrounds and experiences and empower them, because I... I will be honest, perhaps some of the problems with inequitable award rates are the fact that the right people aren't reviewing them. Sometimes the, the people with the most expertise are actually being tapped. So if we expand the pool of potential reviewers, I think that could do a lot to mitigate some of these inequities that we're seeing. Um, we've had two questions come in that I think are um, related to this conversation. and. Um, I will paraphrase them, uh, a couple of them, to kind of get them out into the conversation. Um, I feel like you're already addressing this somewhat, but maybe you have more to say on the topic. Uh, we have an anonymous question that um, observes that scholarly publishing professionals are overwhelmingly white and at the lower levels female. So to what extent is diversity in the published work, publishing workforce necessary to implement DEI initiatives? And um, we have a related question from Kathleen Halverson, who was asking specifically about the um, call for editors in the Autism Journal um, and whether they faced any criticism regarding the intentionality and transparency and coming right out and saying, we're looking for representation from historically marginalized groups. Um, did you get criticism for that or did that feel forced? So, so what I feel like both these questions are kind of getting at is we're identifying um, exclusion at the level of reviewing journal articles, reviewing grant proposals. Um, you know, we can put out the invitation for broader participation. Um, are there other things that we could be doing? And if you feel you've already addressed it, that's fine too, but I wanna, I wanna get these um, participants' perspectives out there. Um, maybe I can add on to uh, starting from Kathleen's question about this, whether people get criticism on that. So I think I, I haven't heard things myself, but I wasn't the one who received all the applications or messages. Maybe our uh, colleagues at Sage will have other opinions on that. But my personal take is that, uh, as Kathleen, you elegantly put there, there, if there's an effort trying to diversify the, the board, um, we need to say it. And then this is recognizing what, what the board looks like so far. Um, there are many ways of saying it. Uh, uh, no matter which way we choose, there will be criticism, which is healthy criticism, because people all want to be more 
uh, diverse. So I don't think there's a right way of saying it. And um, for example, as a person myself, I'm speaking from personal ex experiences. I mean, I, I find it hard to understand what it means by people of color. <laughs> this is a US term, right? So for, for me, I recognize my privilege, my background, but I need to understand what, where the context come from. So, so that's the language that's been chosen uh, to be used in this, in this um, call, but how does the, uh, how would it be perceived uh, for um, people who are not coming from the weird countries or uh, populations. I mean, I think we need some, uh, some qualitative survey to understand how that feels like. So I think this is an ongoing conversation about choosing the, 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 the best or most appropriate language. But I think the intentionality is to diversify at least some of the demographics and perspectives. So I think we do need to put it out there and we do need to be open to be criticized if the intentionality wasn't perceived as uh, intended. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll stop here. I was just going to comment that I think that, that we could have a whole session on inclusive language or how to express or phrase some of this. And the fact, just the fact that it changes over time and space is um, makes it all the more difficult to sort of pin down, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And I really applaud the the efforts of Munchen and his colleagues to to try and um, make that happen. Um, just to touch on the question that was raised, the other question that you mentioned, Liz, um, from the anonymous questioner. Um, I think the discussions about DEI in our publishing, and certainly speaking for Sage, but I know other publishers are considering the same things. Um, the discussions around DEI and our publishing go hand in hand with the discussions and active um, initiatives that we're putting in place to address DEI within our own organization. And I think as the questioner has um, sort of noted, we know that, in, that the publishing industry in and of itself has an issue here. Um, we are not sufficiently diverse or representatives of the communities that we want to serve and support and publish. So certainly within SAGE, there is a whole raft of activity going on, has been for a number of years actually, around um, trying to put um, properly uh, proper recruitment practices, improving our recruit recruitment practices, improving our um, internal sort of career paths and career progression opportunities, making sure that we are um, uh, looking at all levels of our organization and we do have sort of specific um, aspirational targets that, we, that we're trying to meet in uh, both in terms of the representation of women at higher levels of the organization and in terms of the representation of people of color across the organization. So again, it's very much a work in progress, but I see it very much as going hand in hand. And just briefly to, to finally comment on um, the, the sort of reviewer aspect, I, I certainly think that um, by in, increasing represent, representation across our editors, editorial boards and reviewer pools, that will help us drive forward um, and it will help us reach out to um, a more diverse range of authors and also to support a more diverse range of subject matter to be published. Okay, um, several more questions have come in. Um, I'm sort of intrigued by this uh, question uh, that was also from an anonymous attendee um, that puts their finger on a really kind of specific quandary. Um, you know, I feel like we've been talking largely very generally today and um, sometimes the difficulty of implementing these policies kinds of plays out in the particularities. So um, someone asked as journal editors, how do we cope with balancing H indexes and pushing for younger researchers in the review process? Um, any thoughts about that to kind of dig into the specifics of a, a thorny practicality there. Um, so I can, again, I can speak from my own experience as an editor, not representing the editorial team as a whole for autism. Um, 
having said that, I should say that there is an effort uh, from the autism editorial team trying to include more uh, so-called early career researchers into the editorial board and into the review process. So we actually very much encourage uh, early career researchers to become our editorial board members and to be more heavily involved uh, in the process. So that's that's a more of a joint um, 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 effort here. And uh, so I think this is a decision made by the by the editors who are handling the scientific and publishing direction of a particular journal. And each journal may have their own considerations. And autism happens to be the one that the editors have joint vision that we should move forward to uh, supporting more younger generations. Um, I was recruited as an editor uh, several years ago when I was just still an early career researcher. So that demonstrates autism's um, journal editorial team's effort uh, to some extent. And then we are still doing that. So I think this is a decision point among the editors. Uh, uh, and there's this uh, liberty of, of where, what, which direction you like to go to. So um, I can only speak to that maybe from my own perspective. Thanks, anyone else? Well, we are approaching the end of our time here today. So I wanted to say a few things to, I don't know, maybe um, I can't say that I can consolidate this wine raging conversation, but um, I can talk about some of the issues that uh, I've seen raised and maybe use them to kind of um, hone in on some of the things we need to be thinking about as we continue to um, pursue these efforts. And the first is, um, I feel like your presentations together um, really highlight the complexity of increasing inclusion in our research and publishing efforts, because at the same time that we are trying to think about um, bringing more diversity and inclusion into the representation of the authors that um, can participate, we're also trying to think about how to um, increase diversity um, and not just the representation, but also our um, ability to think critically about what's going on in our research for the different populations we study. And sometimes bringing in more diversity of authors um, can help us think more about broader populations, but um, one of those doesn't completely solve the other. And so as we're working in this space, I feel like we are always trying to balance both those questions. Another theme that I saw both in the Q&A and um, in your presentations and answers is the real um, significant and uh, intractability of these structural barriers to participation. And one theme that I feel like kept coming up is the importance to look at the diversity of the people we have taking part as gatekeepers, how to increase that diversity and inclusion, and at the same time, some of the um, difficulty of doing that. And we had a comment in the chat from Pam Reed about how, um, how many of our panels still are really, um, have the kind of token representation that Carolyn mentioned. Another thing that I heard, but we didn't really get time to pick it up, and I hope in other spaces we will, is to, as we pursue these efforts, thinking about how do we assess our success in this area. And again, Carolyn mentioned this, uh, but um, you know we can't improve in areas that we can't measure. And how to do this assessment um, is critical, but it's not always straightforward. So I just wanted to, um, you know, mention the importance of that. And then finally, another theme I heard was the importance of reflecting on our language and the way that it can be exclusionary. And I feel like sometimes um, the attention of that people um, working to promote DEI pay to language gets um, either kind of trivialized or mocked. But I feel like um, in our conversation about it here today, um, it was really clear how the changing in language reflects changing in our thinking about what a category like um, having autism means or what um, it means to be from an underrepresented group. And so continuing to pay import, uh, attention to not only the language, but the language as a marker of how sophisticated our thinking is, is gonna continue to be um, an important effort in this area. So I wanna thank our panelists. I wanna thank Sage and Fabs for organizing this great panel. 
I want to thank all of you here who attended for your participation. And I want to remind you again, if you came in late, that um, a recording of this will be made available to everyone who registers. And it will also be um, available on our website. So um, thank you. I hope you found this as useful and as illuminating as I did. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.